The increased attention that immunotherapies have received has accelerated the pace of discovery. But what does this mean for the field and the technologies that support it? And how will this impact cancer treatments? Whether it's cell therapy-based approaches that go beyond the CD19 cars, or it's going to be a combination of new checkpoints that take us into modulating the tumor microenvironment in a way that allows for immunotherapies to work better. I think in the next five years we'll be seeing both in those areas a, a major impact. So I think in terms of where is the field going, the biologic drugs like the HER2 targeting, they're becoming more and more sophisticated. The antibody drug conjugate actually allow us to use really good chemotherapy and, and just bring it to one cell, not the whole body, which I think is a real advance and, and we know that we can now bring back chemotherapy without their toxicities. So that's a big step forward. The, the molecular recognition what drives tumor is getting more and more sophisticated. I think immunotherapy, not only targeting the tumor, but targeting the immune environment to, to help engage in tumor killing and tumor immune surveillance is, is really just in its infancy and, and going, going really well. I think immunotherapy will become standard of care for many different types of cancer. A lot of our job is going to be trying to help the immune response. Getting lymphocytes into the tumor is one of the big hurdles and we think this is part of the microenvironment. This is an issue of the microenvironment and not only growth factors and other cytokines secreted by tumor cells but also growth factor cytokines secreted by these myeloid cells that come in to the tumor and change the quality and the quantity of T cells. And I think in the next five years, we're gonna to start to understand more about this and how we can enhance the immune response and bring more T cells that are functionally active. And I think that will come about from preclinical understanding. And I think there's going to be a whole series of new inhibitors and drugs that will both activate you know, on the positive side and block negative pathways. Um, we haven't looked at metabolic and anti-metabolites and how we did the lipid cycles and the glucose cycles coming in. And, and you know, patients always had this, this idea that sugar and fat is bad, and it may be, but we have never really been able to exploit this pharmacologically. And then I think another important part that is sort of like a fallout of all of this, we for the first time have a solid understanding who has hereditary cancer mutations. You know, we have now an easy and cheap way of, of looking at patients' uh, germline genetics. We probably, about 2-3% to 3 of, of the general population has a mutation that predisposes them to cancer. So this allows us to do things. This allows us to do prevention studies that are really catered to those at high risk, rather than doing a prevention study in the general population where we have to study 13,000 women to benefit 80, and that's what we did in breast cancer, right? So if you do prevention studies in, in patients with BRCA mutations where the risk of breast cancer is 70% over a lifetime, that's a very different way of doing it. The, the recognition of hereditary mutation also allows us to actually eliminate such mutations from the gene pool, so we could, in certain families, actually, eradicate cancer. So it's, it's not a pipe dream. It still needs a lot of work, but it's a very engaged and excited community to, to work in, so it's, it's quite amazing. I'm really excited about the, the innovations in the microbiome, the humanized mice. These are all interesting product lines that we're developing. What's to come in the next 10 years? Where should we be thinking in the next 10 years? And I think the concept of interception is very compelling. We commonly think of cancer therapies today as a reactive treatment. We get a diagnosis, then we enable a treatment plan, and, and we develop drugs that conform to this methodology. But what if we could understand the human physiology, the development of tumors, the leverage the informatics and machine learning that's becoming the rapid innovation in scientific drug discovery to get out in front of tumors from developing at all? Unfortunately, eradicating cancer altogether is still a distant goal, but improvements on existing therapies is something that will become a reality in the very near future. So like everything else, it evolves at time. So if you remember probably five or six AACR meetings ago, it was almost a molecular meeting. So it was all about the genetics of cancer. And then we started talking about the immunotargeting and now the microenvironmental components of it. 
I'd say about five or six years ago, because we have all these great molecular tools, well, let's just sequence all the mutations and find all the neoantigens that now exist, and we're there. But what we're seeing now is there's some recent companies, what they're doing is they're pulling the T cells that are in the tumor microenvironment. Those are the ones that are there because they can see the tumor. You're, you won't be there as a bystander. You're there because you can actually do something in that microenvironment. Maybe you've been shut down or something. So let's find those T cell receptors. Let's find what they're targeting and let's create cars from them. As these immunotherapies are being tested and analyzed and our toolkit expands, allowing researchers to ask more in-depth questions, the field will have to confront the issue of too much data and how best to get meaning from it. So I think we are actually at a very interesting phase in science because we know whole genome. We have antibodies to almost all cell surface molecules. We have antibodies to all cytokines, right? So we can have protein atlases. We have the genomic atlases. We have expression atlases. We have GWAS. We have the genome of the tumor cells, but the key, the next key we have, where the most functional information is going to come from, is of integrating these atlases into a functional map. See, right now we are still in silos, even though we have so much information, but we have not integrated them so that we can act on these atlases. So they become functional documents. Saying, well, you know what? We are not looking at this in isolation. We are not in silos. We are integrating all of this essential information into an actionable information. And that's what I'm excited about. The idea that the immune system can be harnessed to fight cancer was a novel concept that bore fruit after many years of intensive study. Now the question is, can we take all that has been learned and apply it to other areas of disease research? If I look out 10 years and I look at where we are now in understanding disease in general, what we've come to appreciate is that in everything from diabetes, obesity, type 2 diabetes, to, to heart disease, to brain dementias, the importance of the immune system, its inflammatory, process that, that exacerbates even the genetically controlled disease like Huntington's, that this idea that the immune system is really at the core of so many diseases, you're going to start seeing more and more immunotherapy being used in non-immune diseases. And so yes, we'll be working in infectious disease, yes, in cancer, but we're going to be working in Alzheimer's, we're going to be working in ALS, we're going to be working in muscular dystrophy and trying to use modifiers of the immune system, cells and the like, to deliver payloads, to help repair tissue, to help modify inflammation. And if I look 10 years from now, there'll be more activity of immunotherapeutic drugs outside of immune diseases than inside immune diseases. And I think that's going to be the next phase of this, this whole evolution of how we understand the immune system. Thank you.